Bona tarda a tothom, bon vespre. Estic contenta de ser avui a la Universitat Pompeu Fabra, tan ben acompanyada de la professora Dona Jo Napoli i del professor Quer, amb tants alumnes, amb tants professors i amb les persones del Departament de Cultura, de la Direcció General de Política Lingüística, que m'acompanyen i els quals tots ens uneix avui la llengua, però no una llengua qualsevol, sinó la llengua de signes i, a més a més, en el nostre cas, la llengua de signes catalana. Nosaltres, em sembla que tots els que som aquí, sabem que treballem, que volem un país siguem el país que siguem, on l'accés a la cultura, l'accés a la formació, l'accés a la informació, l'accés a la feina, no tingui cap restricció per raó de llengua. Tampoc per raó de no poder utilitzar la llengua de signes les persones que són o que han de ser signants. Aquest govern de Catalunya sap que això és una prioritat per qualsevol llengua i també per a la llengua catalana. A Catalunya tenim, com vosaltres sabeu, el català com a llengua pròpia i la llengua, la variant de l'occità, aranès, com a llengua pròpia de la Vall d'Aran i també oficials totes dues amb el castellà perquè ho és a tot l'estat espanyol però a més a més tenim la llengua de signes catalana. Les llengües de signes, com sabeu vosaltres, no són universals, com no són tampoc universals les altres llengües, sinó que tots parlem les nostres llengües que són pròpies del territori. Això és important i per això aquest govern treballa per avançar en el desenvolupament de la llengua de signes catalana, per això el professor Quer, que protagonitza una d'aquestes feines principals d'elaboració de corpus amb l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans, que en té l'autoritat normativa, desenvolupem i donem suport al desenvolupament del corpus i també promovem que aquest accés a l'aprenentatge i a la docència de totes les persones que necessiten utilitzar la llengua perquè són sordes o són sorcegues o perquè estan a l'entorn d'aquestes persones perquè en són familiars o perquè en són amics, necessitem que aquesta llengua de signes catalana estigui plenament desenvolupada, sigui coneguda, sigui més fàcilment apresa i a més a més sigui coneguda també la realitat d'aquestes persones i d'aquesta llengua. A Catalunya, si jo no estic equivocada, i això són xifres evidentment que van variant, almenys hi ha 25.000 persones signants, més tot aquest conjunt de persones amb les quals es relacionen. Per això és important per a nosaltres com a govern, com a Direcció General de Política Lingüística, promoure el desenvolupament de la llengua de signes, perquè el que promou una política sempre té com a finalitat última el benestar de les persones. I em sembla que fer instruments, posar a l'abast de les persones aquesta llengua de signes catalana i el coneixement del fet de la llengua de signes és una obligació del govern i un dret de les persones. Per això avui em sembla que ens n'hem de felicitar tots perquè podem, a més a més de saber que estem treballant tots amb el nostre dia a dia allà on ens pertoca tenir la sort d'escoltar la professora dona Jo Pérez 
Napoli, que és una persona entesa en la llengua de signes, a més a més és una persona molt cordial, molt culta, molt afable, molt preparada i en tot cas jo estic segura que aprendrem molt del que ella ens explicarà sobre el dret de les persones a tenir l'accés a aprendre la llengua de signes i en tot cas li demano disculpes en públic perquè és una persona que a més a més de conèixer molt bé la llengua de signes escriu pels nens, pels children, i ha estat traduïda a moltes llengües i no ha estat traduïda encara en català. És un deure, diguem-ne, que ens posem nosaltres per poder llegir també els seus contes d'infants també en català. Enhorabona, us agraeixo que hàgiu acceptat de venir a parlar amb nosaltres sobre aquest tema tan interessant. Moltes gràcies, professor Quer, per haver facilitat aquesta aquesta conferència i poder oferir moltes gràcies a la universitat que ens ha facilitat de poder-ho fer en un entorn tan bonic i tan fàcil i tan agradable com aquest. Gràcies també a la traductora que ens ajuda a entendre'ns entre nosaltres. Gràcies. Ara li passo un moment la paraula gràcies al professor Josep Quer que ens explicarà amb més detall qui és la persona... Ah, sí, perdona. Jo em concentro i vaig fent. Endavant. Moltes gràcies. Senyora directora general, companys, companyes, estudiants i públic assistent, let me warmly welcome you all on behalf of the LSC Lab and the Department of Translation and Language Sciences of this university. We are extremely pleased to have Professor Donna Jo Napoli today among us and to have been able to organize this event together with the uh, General Directorate for Language Policy of the Generalitat de Catalunya uh, in a, a very fruitful collaboration. Last summer, uh, Jordina Sánchez Amat and I read the article Ensuring Language Acquisition for Deaf Children, What Linguists Can Do, which was published in Language, the Journal of the Linguistic Association of America. We immediately thought that we had to disseminate its content as widely as possible, so we decided to translate it into Catalan and Spanish and to have summaries in Catalan and Spanish sign languages. What we couldn't have imagined then is that some months later, we would have the privilege to host one of the authors of that article and to have her tell us about their work face to face. So let me wholeheartedly welcome Professor Donna Jo Napoli to Barcelona and to thank her for having accepted our invitation. For those of you who do not know her, let me just mention that Professor Napoli currently works at the Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, in the United States. After having been affiliated to a number of top uh, North American universities like Harvard, MIT, or Georgetown, among others. In her extensive work, uh, in, in her extensive career in linguistics, she has worked in different domains in the field, and it would be very hard to summarize that in a few words. But I'd like to highlight that Professor Napoli has devoted important part of her work to sign linguistics and has worked on topics such as comparative prosody of sign languages, classifiers, constituent order, but she has also published research on humor, poetry, and storytelling in the sign modality, uh, which is a quite unique combination of expertise. In the past few years, uh, together with, our, with other colleagues, she has engaged in the defense of language rights of deaf infants and children, and today's presentation will focus uh, on this aspect of her work. Apart from a professional linguist, as the uh, Director General mentioned, Professor Napoli is also a prolific writer of children's books and uh, fiction for young adults. Connecting the sign language and the creative, the creative threads, she has also produced bilingual books, e-books, in ASL and English through collaboration of students at Gallaudet University and uh, Swarthmore College. The Linguistics Association of America in this year's awards to Professor Napoli, recognizing her contribution to linguistics, describes her as follows, and I quote, as an eloquent spokesperson on behalf of our field, showing how ideas about language can achieve societal benefit. And further, uh, they credit her with having elevated the discussion of early language experience of deaf children in a new and humane way, moving forward where others would have given up in frustration. I'm sure today's lecture will be another inspiring example of that. Thank you very much, Donna Jo. The floor is yours. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Um, I am so happy to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for inviting me, and thank you to the General Directorate for Language Policy Department of the Ministry of Culture. And thank you so much to the interpreters, both into Catalan and into Catalan Sign Language. And thank you for coming. Um, it is wonderful to see your beautiful faces. Um, uh, my talk is uh, titled Language Access, a Medical Matter, and that is the point that I'm heading toward. I work with a team of people. It isn't just me. Um, we are seven people. Actually, at different times, we sometimes pull in another person. Um, sometimes one of the team won't be able to work, so we go in and out. But the seven of us listed here are the kind of core of the team. Um, we are uh, scholars of cognitive science, education, linguistics, uh, psychology, and one of us is a pediatrician. And everyone on the team is deaf except me. <laughs> um, uh, so it's interesting to be in a minority. Uh, it's good for me. Um, OK. I want to start with some very basic things, because I think sometimes it's hard for people to imagine what it would be like if you did not have language. Language, there are many things about it. If I asked you to list how do you use language in your life, there are some obvious things that you would come up with. Obviously, you use language to express your thoughts, your ideas. That's how you generally get them across to other people. Also, you use language to understand the ideas and thoughts of the people around you. Um, language is generally, if not the major, one of the major accesses to information. That is, if we want information that is beyond our experience, language tends to be the way that uh, that information can get to us. When you have a language, it is part of your identity. You, um, you people in this room know that probably as well as anybody on the globe, around the globe knows it, because you are Catalan signers or Catalan speakers, and you understand what goes into your pride in your language. And um, it, uh, how you use your language is a big part of defining who you are. You are either a relatively reserved, closed person when it comes to language, or you're boisterous and you're all over the place. Um, and uh, it's if you didn't have that, it would be a lessening of your personality. It would be a lessening of your identity. Language is how you make your friends. Language is how you tell jokes and how you catch jokes. And language is how you fall in love. These things are crucial to your everyday existence. But there are less obvious ways that your language is important to you. 
there are a number of cognitive abilities, abilities that go on in your brain that depend on a good foundation in a language. One is literacy. The strongest correlate to being able to learn how to read is facility in a language, any language. Uh, if you don't understand how to use language, how can you learn to read? It, you don't. Another thing is the organization of memory. I don't know why this is so, but they have found that when people do not have a firm foundation in a first language, they cannot chronologically order their memories. They can say that something happened in the past, but they can't tell you that this thing happened before that thing before that thing. Um, that would be a big problem if you could not do that, if you're trying to tell someone what happened. Number manipulation. If you don't have a strong, solid first language, you can't work with numbers very well. Um, you might be able to count, but you have trouble counting past a certain point. We don't count visually. We associate abstract words. We have a word that goes with a number. And you know, you, the, the word is an abstract thing. The number is an abstract thing. We make that connection, but we, we, we can deal with large numbers only via the words that those numbers are called by. Another thing is novel problem solving. If you use language in problem solving, if you don't have it, if it's not strong, if you can't play with your language, you hit a new problem and you're in trouble. And the last thing I want to mention here is theory of mind. I don't know if you know what theory of mind is. Um, psychologists talk about the ability of putting yourself in someone else's shoes. So, um, and what that involves is understanding that we each have a different mind. So if you are a child and, um, and you see uh, somebody uh, walk into a room uh, with another person, two people walk into a room, and one of them is holding a toy, the other person, one of the people leaves, and the person who's there puts the toy in a box. Okay, there's many places in the room where the person could hide the toy, but the person hides it in the box. Um, then the person who left the room comes back in. If you don't have a theory of mind and that person goes around looking for the toy, you think that person's crazy. You expect that person to know that the toy is in the box because you know the toy is in the box. But that person doesn't know it because they weren't there. They didn't see it. That sort of thing, theory of mind, it's critical to understanding stories. It's critical to understanding point of view. If you're reading a story or trying to read a story and you don't understand theory of mind, you don't understand why the story is interesting. You don't know why somebody's surprised at something because you know it. So why don't they know it? So you don't get you don't get any of the excitement out of the story. Reading is boring. Um, many things are incomprehensible to you. Things just seem foolish a lot of the time. 
So these are things that are less obvious about language that are fundamental. They're part of how you use language. They're part of being a human being. These are all things that human beings can do and that pretty much is restricted to human beings. These are singularities of human beings, things that belong only to human beings. OK, now, given that, I want to turn to the situation of deaf children. <laughs> 